on this last night. Thank you, my Father, for pouring out your glory this morning. Thank you for manifesting your glory, Lord. Thank you for speaking to your servants this morning. Thank you for breaking your bread and serving to each and every one of your dear children. Thank you, Holy Father. One more time, we come humbly before your presence. And we stand humbly before you. And we ask you, look kindly upon us. Look graciously upon us. And cause us to taste and see how good you are today. Stretch out your hands, Holy Father, and feed us with the richness of your word. Open the eyes of our understanding, Spirit of the living God. Open the ears of our understanding. Give us an understanding heart and a listening ear that we may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. Teach us, Lord. In the name of our dear Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So we began a journey on the first day. And today it's part three. So tomorrow we will conclude the study with part four. The children of Israel are encamped below Mount Sinai. And that's where this whole drama takes place, or this whole encounter between a people and a holy God takes place. And before they can begin the journey towards Canaan, the Lord God is speaking to them and giving them some instructions First was a preparation. And then he gave them, he told them why he brought them here. And then he goes one step further. And now he's saying, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Today is a covenant making day with God. That's why you are brought here. He told them, before you go any further, first let's make a covenant. So my message this evening, the third installment, installment is entitled, Obey the Covenant. Turn your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 19, and we will read verse 5. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Please look at two important phrases in the first sentence, or the first part of this scripture. Obey my voice, keep my covenant. These are two important phrases you want to zero in and pay attention. Because in making a covenant, God has a part and we have a part. So that's what this is. Now what is a covenant? The word covenant in the Hebrew is berith, B-E-R-I-Y-T-H. And berith means a cutting, a compact made by passing between pieces of the flesh. Now, what does that mean? To understand this meaning, you must read Genesis chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. When God made a covenant with Abraham, he told him to bring some animals. And... They were cut, they were placed 
in a position, one on the right side and one on the left side. And then a deep sleep came upon Abraham and he went into a trance. And in the trance, he saw a vision, a flame of fire or like a pillar of fire moved in the center of the pieces and then turn and walk back. This is an ancient custom that pertains to Mesopotamia of how they make covenants between two parties. They cut the animals and then the two parties will just walk up and down in between the animals to signifying now we make a covenant. And this dead sacrifice is a witness to the agreement that we are going to make. A covenant is a mutual undertaking between the coming together of two parties or more, each binding himself to fulfill obligations. Two parties come together and they make a covenant. A covenant is an agreement between two parties, each privy to one another. So when two persons make a covenant, they know the deals and the terms of the agreement that both are making, just putting their signatures down. A covenant is an agreement made with witnesses where products are used as tokens of signs and witnesses. A good example of this is found in Genesis chapter 17, verses 9 to 13, where God told Abraham to circumcise the foreskin of his flesh. And that circumcision is a covenant sign between God and his people. But in this sense, the circumcision, that act, is a covenant. A covenant is a binding and irrevocable promise. It cannot be changed. Genesis chapter 17 verse 4. A covenant is a promise of agreement. Galatians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. So this is what basically the definition of a covenant is. So in the various examples that I gave you from the scriptures, it illustrates the various definition and examples in the many incidences in the Bible. So each covenant that was made, one is just one single party involved, like Abraham's circumcision. So you do that, and that is a sign between you and me. So that is a covenant, one part of the covenant. On the another part of the covenant is just God Himself making an outright promise. I will make you a great nation. On, for that, Abraham had nothing to do. It's just God initiating a covenant. Then another part of a covenant is both parties must come to an agreement. You agree and I agree. So I agree to come every year in August for this conference. So you agree. Amen? Okay, let's make a covenant now. Stretch out your right hand. But you make sure you don't break your covenant. Okay? Or your hand may be broken. <laughs> See, Bobby Connor is coming back again next year, right? Right. right. You, you made that statement this morning. So stretch out your right hand. Remember, this is a covenant. If you don't mean it, don't do it. Don't put out right hand, put out left hand. <laughs> okay, stretch out your right hand. Say, I covenant. I'll be here, year. Year, year. Year, year after year, year after year, year after till the Lord comes. Till the Lord comes. Amen. 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 Done. 
See, that's why we had the cake today. That's the sign of the covenant. So now remember, don't, don't you break your covenant. Okay? If you break, we'll come near, we will come to your house. <laughs> so a covenant is a binding agreement. And a covenant is effected by the sealing of the blood. If you can recall ancient custom practices, when they make a covenant within 2%, they make a cut in the hand, and then they join the blood together. Have you heard of that? Yeah. So the mixing of the blood signifies, now we are not two, we are now one. My blood is mixed with your blood. So the two becomes one, so I am for you, you are for me. If anything happens to me, you give your life to save me. If anything happens to you, I give my life to save you. That's the kind of a covenant that is sealed by blood that is practiced in the olden days. Today, people just shake hands. Okay, that's why they don't keep their covenants because no cutting of blood is involved. After shaking hands, they use a disinfectant and wash away their hands. <laughs> So, it's not binding anymore. In Exodus chapter 24, verses 6 to 8, after the prophet Moses had received the law from God, he sprinkled the blood of the lamb on the law and on the book to signifying that the covenant that he received from God is now sealed by the blood, sealed with the blood. That is why we read in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, and chapter 13, verse 20, that the new covenant that the Lord Jesus made with us has been sealed with his own blood. Not with the blood of goats and bulls, but with his own blood, which speaks far better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Abel cries for vengeance, but the blood of the Lord Jesus always cries for mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. That's the blood, you know, that is sprinkled on the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. So each time the Father looks at the mercy seat, the blood of the Lord Jesus cries out praying for you. Some once, I went to a small village in South India. This was way back in 1984. There's one uh, wonderful family that loves me too much. So they told me, whenever you come to town, you must visit our house. If not for preaching, at least for a cup of tea. So the family made me make a covenant sign. I said, all right. So that particular one day, so I was in town, so I decided to visit the family. So when I entered into their compound, so they have a large compound and a small house. And this lady, she works as a school teacher, primary school teacher, and her husband is a taxi driver. And they have one little girl. And she was cooking in the kitchen early in the morning. And then I opened the gate and I walk in and she heard the creaking sound of the gate. And she peered through the window, and she saw me walking in. And she left her cooking and came running out to greet me. And as soon as she saw me, she just fell at my feet, and she sobbed, and she sobbed, and she sobbed, without saying a single word. And I didn't know why she was crying. And after she composed herself, I just touched her. Sister, what's your problem? And she burst into crying again. So this was repeated three times. So each time I would ask her, what's your problem? And anointing is released. She'll burst crying. And when she cried for the third time, I perceived in my spirit that she was under some great distress and a great problem that she could not 
bring about to speak. You know, you all know very well that when you have pain in your heart, tears is that outward language of the pain that's in your heart. Am I right, everybody? So she, was, she just caught hold of my leg. She cried and she cried and she cried. And my, I could feel her tears wet my feet. So when I realized that something greatly was troubling her, so I just laid my hand on her head. I closed my eyes and I said, Lord Jesus. The next instant, I saw the Lord Jesus standing by my right side. And he asked me, what do you want? I said, Lord, please look at your daughter. And the Lord Jesus stood, stood down, went very close to where he would see her face. And he saw her, all her tears flowing down. He cupped his hand and put near to her face. And her tears fell into his hand. And there was a small pool of tears in his hands. And he got up and he looked at me and he said, come. The next moment, we were transported to heaven. So at a distance, I saw what looked like the Ark of the Covenant. So we went a little closer. And then the Lord Jesus told me, you wait here while I'll go yonder to pray. And on the mercy seat, I could see a huge, gigantic cloud. And thunders and lightnings came out of the cloud. And it was moving very like in a very angry motion manner. And I perceived in my heart that was the presence of the Father God, like the cloud. And the Lord Jesus Christ went before the ark. And he put his hand into his left pocket and took out a bottle. And he put all the tears in the bottle. Have you read that in the Psalms? That day, I saw it with my own eyes. The scripture becoming alive. So that incident convinced me beyond all shadow of doubt that whatever we read in the Bible, it's all real. Everything is real. Nothing is allegorical. Nothing is spiritual. It's all real. So we must not spiritualize anything. They are all real. And then the Lord Jesus knelt down. He held on to the horns by the Ark of the Covenant and he prayed, sobbing. I could hear his great sobbing. He was weeping, sobbing. You know, tears were not coming out of his lips. Only sobbing, great sobbing. And every now and then, he would stretch out his hand and show to the father like that. So I was wondering, what, what is he doing? Why is he showing his hand like that? So I did something very naughty, you know. I was told to stand yonder, right? So I tiptoed <laughs> very quietly. From that corner, I tiptoed and came and stood where I could see what the Lord was doing. So I stood still at a distance and just directly facing the ark. And then I saw what the Lord Jesus was doing. He was showing his palm with the big hole in his hand to the Father. He said, look at this nail prints. I suffered for my daughter. And then another amazing thing happened. I was shown, although I was still there, I saw from the father's viewpoint what he was looking. When he saw the hole, you know it's not a scar. It's a big hole in the Lord's hand. When he saw the hole, he saw all the last 18 hours of the Lord Jesus' life. From the moment he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane till he died on the cross. All the pain that the Lord Jesus went through. All the weeping, the beating, the spitting, all the agony he saw. The Lord Jesus went through all that. All that for one person. And the Lord cried and he cried and he cried. He said, 
Father, I went through for my daughter. Look at my suffering. And that moved the heart of the Father God. And then a voice thundered. It is granted. Only then the Lord Jesus stopped praying. He got up. He came towards me. And he said, go back and tell my daughter her heart is troubled about three things. And he told me what are the three things. He said, tell her all her tears are wiped away and all her prayers are answered. Amen. So the next moment, I opened my eyes. I was back on earth. So I gently lifted her up and I told her, my dear daughter, these are the three things that are troubling you. Am I right? She said, yes. She said, God has wiped away all your tears. Within one week, all her problems were solved. See, that is the power of the blood of Jesus. If you read Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, when the apostle John saw a company of martyrs in heaven, they cried out to the Lord, saying one word, Lord, how long more? Will you not take vengeance on our behalf? See, that's the cry of a martyr, crying for vengeance. And the cry of the blood of Abel was also vengeance, but not the blood of Jesus. It cries for mercy, mercy, mercy. That is why Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 says, we are not consumed because of the compassions of God. Because... The Lord Jesus Christ is ever interceding for us before the presence of God. That is why his grace and mercy is extending to our life all the time. If not, for all the nonsenses that we are doing in our life, don't you think we should have been destroyed long time ago? Agreed everybody? for all the mess that we are getting ourselves into, we should have been destroyed by a flip of the Lord's finger. Like how he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he could have destroyed us from off the face of this world. But we are not destroyed because of the intercessions of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his blood that sealed the covenant. He not only died on the cross, not only he said, a new covenant I make with you, but he sealed that covenant with his own blood. So a covenant is effected by the sealing of the blood. Now, there are many, many covenants in the Bible. So I was listing down all of them, and then I deleted that because the focus of our message is not about covenants but what happened at Mount Sinai. So I decided to just focus on the most important covenant. That is the Mosaic covenant. That's how theologians call it. The Mosaic covenant. What is the Mosaic covenant that he received from God? It is the law. That is what it is popularly called, the law. Now, what is the law? The law is the Ten Commandments. If you read Exodus chapter 34, verse 27 and 28, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 9, verse 11, verse 13, it says the law is the Ten Commandments. So now we need to ask a question. Is the covenant that God made with Israel that day really the Ten Commandments? A confirmation for that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 2 to 22 and 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 35. These scriptures confirms that the law that was given at Mount Sinai is nothing but the Ten Commandments. Now at this moment, you may feel, oh, all that law has been abolished on the cross. Many Pentecostals, many theologians preach like that. I, for once, preach like that. If not preaching, at least I believe that. Until this year. 
last night I told you that uh, the Lord had me wait on him from December right up to April. Remember that? So during the period of waiting, so there was this revelation of the Melchizedek that was given to me. After the Melchizedek, or even before the Melchizedek, from the month of March, the Lord began to speak to me about the ministry of Moses. And he showed me the scripture in Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. He said, last year, you introduced and opened the door, prepared the way for the spirit and the power of Elijah to be released all over the world. Now, you need to prepare the way for the Moses spirit and power to be released. So I wondered, now where is it written? Then he directed my thoughts to Malachi chapter 4 verse 4. And Malachi chapter 4 verse 4 says, Remember the law of Moses. That's how it starts off. So when I read that, I had a problem. Why remember the law when the law was abolished? So I had a big, big problem with that first part of the scripture. Lord, this is a problematic scripture. I told the Lord this. Why remember the law when it is abolished? And then I reread and I reread that four, five, and six together over and over again. The entire chapter four of Malachi talks about these last days in which we are living. It doesn't talk about the first century church. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, I believe with all my heart the law was abolished because the scripture says like that. I have no question about that. I am in perfect agreement with what the Bible says. However, the problem is when Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 says, in the great and terrible day of the Lord when it comes, that great terrible day of the Lord did not come in the first century. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, when the law was abolished, that period is not the great and terrible day of the Lord. Because the Lord Jesus Christ came to bring grace. When his disciples John and James wanted to call down fire because one particular village did not receive the Lord Jesus, he told them, you do not know what manner of spirit you have received. The spirit you have received is not the spirit that was upon Elijah to call down fire. I have come to bring peace, to bring salvation. So that tells us that the, during the whole time of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was not the great and terrible day of the Lord. But here Malachi says, when the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, I will send you Elijah. And before he, before he sends you Elijah, he says, remember the law of Moses. So I began to ask the Lord, Lord, you must teach me what is this law? Then I can safely stand anywhere in the world and tell them your word to prepare the way. So over the period of the whole month of March and April, the Lord began to teach me every day what it means. What is the law? The law, you know, when the scripture talks about the law, the statutes, the judgments and the commandments. It's not just the Ten Commandments. It also included what is today called, or what theologians call the ceremonial laws. Don't do this, don't do that. For example, when a woman is menstruating, she's not supposed to go to the temple. She's unclean. So those are ceremonial laws. It is these ceremonial laws that were nailed on the cross, not the Ten Commandments. Let me give you one solid proof. If the Ten Commandments were all nailed on the cross, then we can commit adultery. Right? Because that law of do not commit adultery is now gone. Am I right, everybody? Yeah. Then you can steal. Because the commandment, thou shalt not steal, now gone. 
then we can kill one another. Because thou shalt not kill is now gone. And we can worship so many other gods. Because the first four are all gone. Is it true? No. Right? No. We don't worship any other gods. We honor our parents. We do not kill. We do not steal. We do not tell lies. We do not covet. We do not commit adultery. So, the Ten Commandments are there. They have not been abolished. It's a ceremonial laws of unclean and clean that were all done away. That is the reason why in Acts chapter 10, we read that the Apostle Peter fell into a trance and he saw a white sheet come down from heaven with all kinds of unclean animals. And God tells him, Peter, cut and eat. Have a great buffet. So when Peter saw that, he said, no, Lord, no. Oh, Lord God, I am a pure vegetarian. No, that's not what he said. He said, Lord, I am a Pharisee, Jew. How can I eat unclean animals? So the Bible tells us this vision was repeated three times. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything shall be established. Right? So the, the Lord was calling Peter to go and preach to the Gentiles. But he said, no, 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 no. I am a Jew. I don't go there. So anyway, out of God's great mercy, he opened the door for him to go and preach at a Gentile's house. And you know, being a Jew, he was still very straight jacket with all his collar, tight white collar. Have you seen that? White collar with his long rope and with his shepherd's staff. And he goes and he stands there and he preaches a sermon with, with a very hoarse voice. That's how they preach, you know. And of course, he was being very reserved, very careful not to preach everything. He didn't want to preach salvation to them because they are Gentiles. They're not supposed to hear the gospel. So it's so unfortunate that he was pushed to the Gentiles' house. And while he was preaching unwillingly, the Bible says God was getting tired of waiting for him. <laughs> so the Lord was waiting for him to start praying and he wouldn't budge. So the Lord decided to overrule Peter and pour out the Holy Spirit upon Cornelius household. They were all feeling the Holy Spirit. They started speaking in unknown tongues. Now Peter was at a loss, didn't know what to do. Because the meeting was out of his hand now. This happened in my ministry early last year. You know, normally when I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a certain formula that I follow. Because when I follow this formula, everyone will surely be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in unknown tongues. So there's a formula, a four-part formula. So that particular day, it was on the a very remote village. 300 people had gathered very hungry to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So I, I preached the first message, explained to them who the Holy Spirit is because they all come from different backgrounds, from Anglican, from Presbyterian, Methodist, First Presbyterian, Second Presbyterian, Third Presbyterian, <laughs> you know, First, Second, Third, Fourth, Fifth, they all come everywhere. And uh, so we, they all have different ideas about the Holy Spirit. Some believe, some don't believe. Some in the middle, maybe, maybe not. So first I need to wash their brains uphand all their old theology, clean their head so that it can be empty. Then you fill it with new theology, Bible theology. So after doing that, then it was time to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So there, there was a mixed crowd. There were about 100 people who were already filled in the Holy Spirit. So it is my practice, what I do is, I get all those who are not filled in the Holy Spirit to stand up, and these people who are feeling the Holy Spirit to come and help pray for them by speaking in unknown tongues. This is my standard practice. So we remove all the chairs, and I was going to ask them all to stand. By the time when all the chairs were removed, they were all jumbled up and mixed up, 
and I didn't know how to differentiate or how to call the meeting to order. So I was wondering how am I going to get in order now? I said, all right, let's somehow I'll do something. So I was preaching the last message, giving them a four-pointer message, how to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and with the initial sign of speaking tongues. As I was speaking from outside the tent, this meeting was held in a field, so they had constructed a tent. From the entrance outside, I saw a huge cloud roll and come into the tent. When it came in, every one of them were filled in the Holy Spirit and started speaking unknown tongues. I said, oh my God, I haven't gone through the formula yet. <laughs> So it went on and on and on, and uh, the meeting was out of my control. So I, I pulled a chair and I sat down on the stage and allowed God to do his work. Every one of them who were not filling the Holy Spirit were filling the Holy Spirit that day. And their spiritual eyes were open and they saw visions of God. And then after the meeting, when we gave time for testimony, almost 200 people came up to share testimony of what they saw. See, this is what God is, going, is doing in these last days. Bypass our man-made traditions. Bypass everything. He said, come to me as you are. Let me do my work. You know, once I preached at a pastor's conference, the Lord Jesus cried with tears running down his eyes. And he told me, he said, tell the pastors, give my church back to me. That's what he said. Give my church back to me. I want my church back. You are, run, you are running my church like how you like. Give it back to me. Give my bride back to me. That was the earnest, tear-filled plea of the Lord Jesus. Give my church back to me. You know, this is something God is going to do in his last days. You read this in Matthew chapter 21. When he entered into Jerusalem, the first thing that he did, before any preaching, before any signs and wonders, he made a whip and he whipped out Every false apostle, every false prophet, every false teacher, every false pastor, every false evangelist, out of the temple. Everyone who was building his own empire were kicked out of the temple. When all these old pretentious clergy, workers of God, were kicked out, then the Bible says, the lame, the blind, the deaf, and the dumb, they all came into the temple. And the Lord Jesus Christ preached, taught, and healed them all. This is going to be repeated again in these last days. So those pastors, those leaders who want to be the boss will be kicked out. And God will raise up new leadership. This next new leadership will be the faceless, the nameless, and the selfless. It's the nobodies, the children, the youth, the old men, the old women. They will rise up and do great exploits for God in these last days. So, which means children, youths, old men, old women, Ordinary folks, they are all you. I mean, you are going to be the superstars in the last days. Upon you, God will pour out the powers of the age to come and use you mightily like never before history has ever witnessed. That is why you must get ready. But remember one thing, 
when God pours out his glory upon you, don't make the mistakes of your forefathers. Don't make the mistakes. Don't take money for the anointing of God. Don't take a fee for preaching. Those are all the mistakes your forefathers have done. And don't go on the airwaves and ask for a huge sum of millions of dollars to buy a plane when you already have so many planes in your hangar. <laughs> don't do all that. You don't need that because God is going to transport you from place to place. Amen. Amen. He's going to supernaturally transport you place to place. You know, last week I was in Nigeria and I met a bunch of university students who have this supernatural transportation like it's an every common nature to them. These are just university students. They are transported geographically all over Africa and to even other nations in the world to preach and to pray for people. As soon as they finish their work, they are transported back to their hometown. And these kids, I saw them, you know, they have no ass about them. They don't even think about that at all. They couldn't, they, they don't focus on that. They, they think it's just an ordinary job that I'm doing. See, that is the attitude you should have. Nameless, faceless, selfless. If God gave this kind of anointing to those kind of preachers who want an airplane, you know what they will do the next minute? Cameraman! Come here, quickly. Come on. Bring the camera. Quickly. Tell me, sister. Come here, sister. Come here. Come on, come on, get up. Come on, get up. Camera, tell to the camera. Tell to the world. Where did you go? Europe. Ah, Europe. Oh, Europe. Which place in Europe? Uh, Paris. Paris! Oh, Paris! Look at this Paris! Oh, Paris! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Paris! What did you do there? Come on! Come closer! At dinner! Dinner! Wow! Wow! Come on, everybody! Say hallelujah! 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 How many of you had this experience? Come on, put up your hand! Okay, for a thousand dollars! For a thousand dollars! How many thousand dollars? Come on! You'll sit down. <laughs> Poor woman, she's lost. Oh, I'm, I'm just enacting a drama. <laughs> you have seen all these clowning acts, right? Yes. People of God, you must not make that mistake. This, these are the mistakes of your forefathers. You must crush them under your feet. Don't touch the glory. The glory belongs to God. Amen. 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 I tell you one truth. Your eyes have not seen. Your ears have not heard. Neither has it entered into your mind. How great an anointing God is going to pour out in these last days.